Welcome to worship at Seven Locks Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you join us today. Thank you if you're gathering here with us in person or if you're at home watching. It is great to worship with you today as we celebrate God's grace and mercy and His goodness. Our first song this morning is I Want to Know You or In the Secret, so please join us. from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything but yet to be thrown out and trampled by people. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our next song is, I Will Call Upon the Lord.
Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the great joy to be gathered together both in person and online today to lift up praises to you. God, you've given us something special, and it's your grace. It's what makes us, it's what shapes us, and what, it's what characterizes our relationship with you, Lord. It's what you've called us to characterize our relationship with others. It is the unique element, God, that you have brought to this earth and have shared with us and asked us to share with others. God, would you fill our hearts with that grace as we open your scriptures this morning. Lord, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, a few years ago, we got a very neat Christmas gift. We got one of those big Himalaya, chunks of Himalayan salt that's a salt lamp. Now, they're supposed to have a lot of different health benefits uh, from anything of, of having a, a calming effect to taking some of the different harmful electromagnetic pulses that go all throughout our homes because of Wi-Fi and cell phones and all the, the various electronic interference. And I believe there are several other health benefits, and I'm not sure of all of those and how they directly impact us, but I can tell you that when we turn it on, it's really soothing. It adds a certain ambiance to the room that you do not get any other way. And as I was thinking about that this week and thinking about our passage this morning where Jesus tells us as the followers of Christ to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, I thought, wow, what a great way to look at this passage and what Jesus is saying to us that we are called to be salt and light and so basically salt lamps in a way we bring a flavor to the world to our community to the world around us that it cannot get anywhere else and we have the light that's been given to us the light of Christ that we've been called to share and live and be and do so in a way that stands out that is different that is very conspicuous from the rest of the world and how the rest of the world dialogues and the conversation and discourse, we have an opportunity to be different. In fact, we have a calling to be different and that's what we're going to explore as we dive into this passage today from Matthew 5 verses 13 through 16 where again Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, it loses the ability to be salt anymore, what is it good for? Nothing really except to be thrown out and walked on. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And in the same way, when someone lights a lamp, where do they put it? Under a bowl? No, that doesn't make sense. That's ridiculous. Instead, they put it up high on a table or on a mantle so that the light of the lamp can give light to the whole room. In the same way, let your light shine before all people so that they may see the good that you do and glorify your Father in heaven. There are a lot of different ways that you can dive into this passage and explore it and, and preach. In fact, I think this is at least the third sermon that I've written on these verses, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. But this morning, the element of salt that I want to focus on, that I really think that for today, in 2021, that, that stands out as something we really need to explore is the notion that we are to give a different flavor to the world than it can find anywhere else. And that flavor is the grace that Jesus gave through his death and through his resurrection and the way that he modeled to do life and to live while we were here. That way of life, that way of grace, you don't find it anywhere else. Not in the same way. If you do a deep dive into the teachings of other religions, you will find that most of them emphasize what you must do to be acceptable in the eyes of the deity or God or who, however they express that essential truth. But when you look at the gospel, 
and what it says to us. It's not about what we do, but what's been done for us. And it's that mercy and grace that frees us and gives us a different flavor. And Jesus says, if you are going to be my disciples, this is what it looks like. It's to be salt, to bring a flavor that you cannot find anywhere else. One of the great exciting things about living in this area is that we have people from all over the world. So we've had an opportunity to try all kinds of different flavors uh, of different cuisine that, that's very different from what we've experienced in the past. And they stand out. You can tell when you sit down at a certain kind of food, it tastes differently. Mexican, Greek, Middle Eastern, they all have these certain nuances that add to our experience. But in the same way, as followers of Christ, we have been called to add something to this world that it cannot get elsewhere. And that's grace. It's mercy. It's compassion. It's to look at people the way Jesus did, that when he saw the crowds coming towards him, he had mercy on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus says, as his followers... That's our calling, is to embrace people, to see them as those in need, to have this flavor of grace. And if we do not live out that grace, they can't find it anywhere else. And if the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. Now, when Jesus says that in the first century, he's talking about salt that was mined for, or dug from the bottom of the Dead Sea. Some of it was mixed with just regular sand. So over time, if you keep piling this impure salt in one place, you're going to end up with more sand than salt, and it's not going to be salty, and they would toss it out. So his first century audience would have understood that and grasped what he was trying to express in that, was saying this. But what he's saying to us is that we cannot lose that flavor of God's grace. Because if we do not bring that grace and that kindness and compassion into our response to people who will. In the same way he said, you are the, the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Now the light that we've been called to shine is not our own light. It's not to call our attention to ourselves or our abilities or our achievements, but to call attention to the one true light, the way, the truth, and the life that is Jesus that we've been talking about this past month. To show them that the way to hope, the way to peace and grace and mercy is Jesus. And we're to share that light with others. Now, one thing to key on and pay attention to here is Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In the sense that this is not, this grace and this way of living that Jesus has given to us is not simply something that we are to hold on to for ourselves for our own community of faith, but it is something that we are to be present, living out amongst our community, amongst our world. And granted, right now, that looks a little differently than it most likely normally would, but that doesn't take remove the calling for us to be instruments of God's grace and instruments of God's truth spoken in love, pointing the way to hope, which is Christ. Finally, there is a, the last metaphor that Jesus uses ties all of this together, where he says, you are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. You know, the region and their geography of Palestine is characterized by a lot of hills and valleys. And if you've ever been in a flat place, driving towards a mountain and seen a community that either a couple of houses or a small town on a hillside, you can see it. For miles, you, at night you can see the lights. You can't hide it anywhere. And Jesus' point in expressing it in this way is to say that, that it should be obvious and that we are his followers, that we are called to be those who bring that flavor of grace, the light of truth, the light the way to Jesus, and that it's obvious in us. There's no, there's no questioning or no mystery that... We are who we say we are, and it's evident by the fact that we are folks who live as people of grace, seeking to live in that light of following Christ, knowing that He is our only hope. He is our only way. It's almost like there, there's no question. If you hear 
the Looney Tunes music come on. It's obvious what's coming next, right? Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, one of those characters. There's no surprise. It's not like you hear the, the Warner Mary Melodies theme from the old Looney Tunes commercials and expect to see Mickey Mouse. It's obvious what's coming next. And that's what... That's the same way that we ought to be obvious. We're to be, another word that I heard a commentator use, as followers of Christ, Jesus wants us to be conspicuous. Not in the sense that we're shady or that questionable, but that, it, that we stick out. We stand out in a crowd. We're not like the old Where's Waldo books where you have to spend an hour trying to find one dude in a red and white sweater and a stocking cap. There's no mystery to that. We ought to be, it'd be evident that we follow Christ. So, what does that look like? To bring this to an, a place of application, to bring it home. What does that look like for us in 2021? And on the, hopefully the backside of a global pandemic. What does it look like to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden? I think there, it's, it's an opportunity for us to reconnect with the flavor that is to be our, our very personalities in our lives and to be the defining characteristic of us as we follow Christ, and that's grace. To see how that grace is modeled. And to look again at the person of Christ and long to be, as Edwin Friedman describes, a non-anxious presence. He talks about in his book, A Failure of Nerve. Now, Freeman was not a follower of Christ, but if you read in his book about what it means to be a non-anxious presence, someone who knows who they are, who understands where they begin and where other, and they end and where other people begin and, and what they're responsible for, and they're able to not be in a constant place of reacting, but be at peace and be able to make the decisions and the choices that they need to make. Now, we hear that, and, and I hear that, and it, it's a struggle. It's, it's something that I aspire to be. But if you study and you read the Gospels, you see that that is a great way of expressing who Jesus is. He is a non-anxious presence. He knows who he is. He understands his calling. He is very has a tendency to withdraw and to pray and to some people who come to him and ask for things, he will say yes, and others he will say no. Based upon who he is and what he knows God has called him to do. And there is no time like the present than for all of us to commit to studying and reading in the Gospels, not simply to gain a lot of information or facts about who Jesus is, but to study his character and to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to say, this is who I need to be, I understand that, but apart from you I cannot cannot be this non-anxious presence, but I know that I need to, to have a clear understanding so I'm not in a constant place of reactivity. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves. I know I've spent a lot of years living that life too. So, I think being the salt of the earth means praying and asking God to help us cultivate that non-anxious presence. Why is that so important in communicating grace? Well, because... Friedman talks about this in his book, but psychologically, when we are in a constant place of fear, it, it inhibits us from being able to show compassion, compassion and kindness to others, to have a response outside of self-preservation. And there has been a lot of these big feelings that we've been processing this year. And a lot of them very much justify this is a situation none of us were ever prepared to be in. None of us dreamt we would ever go through what we've gone through. But here we are. And now, how is it that we can deal with these feelings and emotions that we are those of others and proceed forward in a way that generates compassion and kindness and not fear and anger and frustration? Not that we don't all deal with these things and these emotions, because we do. But how do we go forward in a way that's wise and Christ-like? And I'm telling you, this is a great way for us to be the salt of the earth right now, to elevate the discourse of our country, which if you pay attention to the headlines or social media, you know that we've got had issues. 
with how we interact with one another. And I've said this before, and I firmly believe the opportunity that God is giving us to change the course of the conversation by being people of grace and compassion, not doormats that we let people run over us, but how we respond to others in this time raises the level of the conversation. You know, in the first century, Christianity had its share of critics. In the 21st century, they do too. But one of the amazing things about the first century Christians that characterized them was their compassion. A lot of people didn't understand our beliefs or, or the terminology that we used, even back then. And so that led to misunderstandings and criticism and people mocking and making fun. But meanwhile, all of those things were happening... Christians, the, one of the places the early church really stepped up was in their compassionate response to the Roman culture. They were known for rescuing babies that had been thrown out in back alleys and adopting them and taking them home as their own children. Those who were unwanted, they welcomed them in. They were known for the way they treated people. That in a time where, where who you knew in the hierarchy of, of the social system was even more important than it is today, they responded with compassion and advocated for equality. They advocated for just seeing people as human beings, when sometimes that was difficult for others. And that led one of their first century critics to say, I can say a lot about Christians and their thoughts and their beliefs, but I cannot criticize them for how they love and the way that they respond to those around them. What a great thing that could hopefully be said of us in the 21st century. And if it's not, now's the time to move that forward. And, and lighting the way, it's the same way. To speak the truth in love. To light to, in a time where, where folks are hopeless and they're struggling and they need encouragement to say, look, I, can I just share with you about Jesus, the one who's changed and touched my life. And the way that we conduct ourselves, it ought to be conspicuous. We ought to stand out. And that takes boldness. It takes courage to move forward in a time where there's been so much uncertainty, there's been so much anxiety, there's been so much anger. It would be easy for us to retreat and wait for the storm to pass. But... That's not where God has called us. God has called us as the followers of Christ, as Jesus said, to be standing up on a city on a hill so people can see us. Not simply to see us, but to see Jesus reflected through us, the most important thing. I was reminded of this from the most unlikely place this week. From one of my old friends that, that I hadn't seen in a long time. I learned my very first martial arts moves from this guy. His name is Mr. Miyagi. And at the end of the Karate Kid Part 3, Daniel-san, the hero of the movies, is facing this crazy karate dude in the tournament. And he's falling over, and he's basically in a ball, wrapped up on the ground, because this guy's just beating the tar out of him. And Mr. Miyagi comes over to him, and he says, Daniel-san, focus! He says, I can't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And he says, listen, it doesn't matter if you lose in this tournament, but you cannot lose to fear. He said, I will tell you this. The best karate is still inside of you. Now, how on earth does that apply here? I'll tell you. What I really felt, God, pulling all of these things together this week, is that this is a time where we're, we're dealing with a lot. And we need to be wise in how we approach that. But it's a time for courage. It's a time to realize that even after everything has been jumbled and shuffled, and it, remember the old lotto that they, before they did the computer thing, they'd have the, the, the big basket that they turned all the numbers in? I kind of feel like that's the world we've been living in. Not that we're the person turning the crank, but we're one of the balls being flipped and turned and flopped all over, all year long. It's like, what else? Come on, man. But even when we, we feel like that to know that, that the best of what God wants to bring out of us, no, no matter how we've handled things, but the best of, of where we are going and what God wants to do in us and, and telling people about Jesus and, and sharing the gospel and, and having ministries that engage and encounter and encourage our church, the best of who we are 
is still, God is still bringing that out of us. He's still bringing the flavor of His grace to the surface of our lives. He's still bringing His light to the point where we shine, to where we are as followers of Christ. A city on a hill that when people look at us, they don't see us, but they see Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. We need your grace and mercy to flow through us so that we truly can be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. God, hear our prayer today. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our next song is Hymn 182, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. This is the part of our service where we're going to turn the cameras around so everyone can say hello and, and wave. Uh, we invite everyone in the sanctuary to wave and say hello. And if you're at home, we won't be able to see you, but we invite you to wave back and let you know that we miss you. We can't wait till we can all worship together again. We are excited and longing for that day. But until then, here are a few of your friends that you might have missed. doing a 
slow pan here. One announcement, we want to remind you that our business meeting, our quarterly business meeting is coming up Sunday, January the 31st. That'll be uh, live on Zoom that night at 7 p.m. We invite you to join us for that. Uh, the Zoom link will be sent out in about a week's time. Uh, if you do not receive that, please reach out to us. We'll be glad to include you and uh, invite you to be a part of that. It has been a great day to worship together. I'll tell you what, it, 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 I always look forward to this point in this week, and it always seems like it goes by so fast. But thank you for joining us for worship, whether you're with us online or you're in the sanctuary. It's great to be together, and we're so thankful to God that even in the climate that we find ourselves, there is a way for us to connect and worship together. And so as we close today, we want to remind you that wherever we are gathered in the name of the Lord, Scripture says that he is there. When two or more are there, he is present. And so if you're in your living room this morning or if you're here in the sanctuary, wherever it might be, Maybe you're in the car driving. That's your sanctuary. And as we close, we're going to sing Sanctuary as our closing today. So we invite you to sing with us. for worshiping with us today. If you are live with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to remain in, in your seat until the ushers come and dismiss you. But if you're with us at home, it has been great to worship with you. We can't wait to see you on Wednesday night for our prayer and devotional time. That'll be 6.30 p.m. and back here in the sanctuary next Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Until then, go in peace and serve the Lord.